Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, or thank the committee for asking me to, to be here. I've always uh, consider uh, uh, inviting to be invited to speak in AA. It's a, it's a very special experience for me. I think that if anybody should have told me, particularly in the early days when I was young, that one day uh, I can look back in my own life without... Uh, those feelings of guilt and shame and the unworthiness that talk about last night. Uh, I guess I would have never believed it. It seems that I lived with those feelings for so long that I really didn't know that there was another way to live. And I think the uh, to be able to listen to to other people and to be able to see myself. It's one of the probably uh, special experiences that I call, that I have been given since I've been in a program, what is like today. I particularly enjoy my life today. Uh, I've always wanted to travel, and I did, of course. Uh, I lived in the skits for seven years, and I traveled steady but slowly. And... and uh, so it's always uh, it's always uh, exciting experience for me when I'm invited someplace. You know, I lived for so long and I was not invited anywhere. <laughs> and especially when they ask you to travel on a jet. You know, when you when you walk for so long as I do, and all at once now you're traveling in the jet, it takes years to get used to it. <laughs> but I liked it. I consider myself to be fortunate. I really, I really believe that uh, I am alive today because of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I lived in the Skid Row for seven years, and when I arrived in AA, I was in my twenties, and I remember how difficult it was for me in those days to sober up. Uh, a person like me, you know, I usually go to Salvation Army or in a mission. And in those days, it used to take me about three or four days. And in the summertime, I would spend uh, back in the mission. There was a grass about four or five feet high. I can't stay inside when I'm sick because uh, I, I get very sick. You know, I have nightmares and, and I have cramps. And I have tri eaves and, uh, and in Salvation Army, you live in a dormitory with 70 or 80 people, and, and this, that's not a best place to sober up. <laughs> so I would sober up outside. And about four days after I stopped drinking, I could have a soup in my stomach. Now I look back. I am now 58 years old. I tell you that because I wear it well. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, then I asked myself a question. Would I survive if had I not been fortunate enough to come to AA? And if I did, where I would be tonight? Certainly not sitting all afternoon next to a swimming pool. <laughs> and I got a room, have two beds in it. I don't know why, but, uh, <laughs> You know, I've learned to live like a white man. I'm getting used to it. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh. But I, I think more than anything else, I really like the idea of being able to see myself in people from all walks of life. Uh, and to be able to learn 
listening like the speakers I've listened to uh, this weekend. I don't think that I have ever believed. There are many things that I would have never believed when I was new in the program. I don't think I would have ever believed that I'm the type of person would be asked to travel anywhere to speak, never mind paying my expenses. <laughs> uh, you know, for those of you who paid your own expenses, I'm not cracking jokes. Uh, <laughs> some of us have it and some of us don't, and that's the way it is. <laughs> Besides, you can afford it and I can't. But, you know, I, I, because I was so sensitive that I never talked with English, and I didn't speak in AA for two years, uh, because uh, being sensitive is the worst thing in the world, because you're always wondering what people think about you. And I, I never learned how to read and write. And it's funny how I misunderstand that, too. I felt that if you have no education, then you're not as good as the next person. I really don't know where I get the idea. But I walked with that for better than 33 years. You know, and even in those days, it took me a long time to... Uh, start realizing that I was no different than anybody else except I couldn't read and write. And being an Indian, it, it always bothered me. I remember in New York State, in my time when I used to drink, there was a bar room that I liked to go, but they didn't want to serve Indians. They said that never give an Indian a fire water, he goes crazy. <laughs> and, and I believe that. You know, I was sober many years in AA. And one night I was in a meeting in Boston, and, and I looked around and I said to myself, whoever that wise man was, the bastard, he never seen an Irish drunk, or you would never make such a statement. <laughs> <laughs> And I think when I say a special experience, something wonderful goes on in, a, a, in time. Uh, now I stand up here. Uh, I still don't talk with English. God knows I, I try. Uh, uh, before, I, I was sober two years in AA, and, and I wanted to speak because I think that's what happened to most of us. If we keep coming back to meetings, I was afraid to speak, and yet I wanted to. And Paul, who is a friend of mine, says to me, John, there is a group in this area. You should go there because that's where all the lawyers and doctors and television and radio people go there, and they use big words. And maybe you can learn something from them. So every Tuesday night, I went to this meeting for all the lawyers and doctors and television people and radio people speak there. And I went there for a year. And the only thing I've learned a year later, I figured they were as crazy as I was. <laughs> <laughs> and I met a couple, I swear, who were educated beyond their intelligence. And, 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 and that made me feel good. But I think to be able to stand up and, and still having all these things, and I, I, no question that a meeting like this, you, you do have probably your doctors and lawyers and people with education, people with money. You have people from all walks of life. And I think the wonderful thing about it is that I am not offended or feel unworthy or different because of these things. Instead, I'm truly grateful that I can look back in my own life today, not shame or with guilt, but a gratitude because I think the type of an education that I have been given here 
It has given me a new vision. And today I see things that I have passed by for many years in my life. But my life wasn't always like this. I was brought up in a in a little reservation in Canada, province of Quebec. And uh, my my father, well, my father liked to drink. Very much. And when he died, he had a half a gallon of jug under his bed. And uh, my family, eight, eight members of my family died after five years when my father died. I had twin brothers who died in the same year. All my family died with TB. When I was four, when I was 13, my mother was dying with TB. And of course, I was afraid. I was very much afraid that uh, I had TB. And I was afraid I was going to die. And uh, I was sleeping with my mother. And I remember early in the morning one time, because I, as I know today, I became obsessed. Dying. I couldn't forget about it. And I remember asking my mother if I was going to die too. And she says to me, no, that I was different. And uh, that I was very strong. And she was very proud of me because I don't cry. And after my mother died, I, I couldn't find a home because also my people were afraid of TB. And I, I didn't know it then. I wasn't... Uh, I look back now and I realized that the only reason I couldn't find a home because my people were afraid of TB. So I, I stayed another year in that reservation and I lived in an old empty house that uh, was there uh, with a dog. And uh, I think that uh, I started to uh, to escape uh, the best that I know how, at least. I started to spend a lot of time imagining a life Maybe because I couldn't accept it. I remember sleeping between two mattresses. Uh, every night I used to pretend that I was somewhere else. I imagined that I was, uh, that I lived in a big home and that I had a lot of nice clothes and, and a nice car and a nice girl. <laughs> and I suppose if you're, if you're going to dream, why not dream big? You know, it, it costs the same. <laughs> but I, I suppose what I felt, that if you have all these things, then you don't feel the way I did inside. And uh, now I think, well, I was thinking about that last night because I went to the next room and they were talking about, I think the, they were talking about feeling of belong. Uh, one of the amazing things I've discovered about my life that I have never been a different kid. I only felt different. I, 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 even I can say that I have never been a bad person. You know, people talk about stealing and hurting people. I, I have never done that. I, I, I was just a drunk, you know. <laughs> or oh, I hurt people at times when, when I want to prove to another bunch just who I was. <laughs> and I tear a few pants off from the cops and, uh, and, uh, I face one judge 43 times. Those little things, but, <laughs> but that's when I was having fun. And that was before I had trouble, you know what I mean. But I, uh, 
my problem was that I couldn't accept John the Indian. And I think one of my biggest recoveries in life is learning to, because I am, I think like a lot of people I listen to, I've always wanted to be somebody. All my life, I wanted to be important. And I remember uh, when I left a reservation one time, I went to see a, a show of John Wayne. Boy, did I love John Wayne. I mean, I'd stay all day, all day watching his movies. I, I didn't like the way he killed Indians. <laughs> but I... But what I admire is that when he's ready, he will do exactly what he believes in. And that, to me, is, is what human beings are special. That's why no machine can do what human being does. I think that my problem, for better than 35 years or maybe 40 years in my life, I have never once considered that what I admired others, those things reserved to me also. And, and I remember sitting in a discussion meeting one night, I don't know how many years I was sober, when someone was reading this stuff, because that's the only way I've learned. I, I learned by listening. And he was reading in a second step where he says that the key that opens the door to a program of recovery it is willingness to believe and faith. It's the spirit of independence. It is where you learn to walk on what you believe in. And the thought came to my mind. That's why I liked about John Wayne. <laughs> but I never once felt that uh, if John Wayne can do it, I can try too. <laughs> it never entered in my mind. My people talk about uh, lumber camps in Maine. And when I was 14, I decided to leave home because I felt I wasn't wanted. And sometimes later, uh, I arrived in Patton, Maine, and I asked if I could get a job in lumber camp, and I was told that I was too young. I was only 14. But the Army, the Second World War, was about ready to start, and all the younger people joined the Army, and he said they need a, a dishwasher. But the CC camp, they call it a CC camp, it's about 25 miles in the woods, and if I wished to walk that far, it was up to me. So I did, and I got a job washing dishes, and I stayed there for four years. And I met, uh, I became friendly with the man who was in charge. His name was Bill Langster. And now and then he would bring me to his home. I met his family. And uh, they, they felt, four years later, they felt that I should leave. Because living in the woods with people who were much older than I was, felt was not healthy. I should join the younger people. The army was going on, and I decided to leave the lumber camp and go back to Canada, because my idea of uh, being in the service was to put on a uniform and go back home and show my people that I have grown and now a soldier. I was told that if I should join the army in the United States, I would be so far away from home, I couldn't go home, and I didn't like that. So I went to Quebec City. I don't know why I went to Quebec City. They're all French, and I cannot talk French. <laughs> but I joined the Canadian Infantry, which is another French regiment. But it didn't matter, because I learned much later that if you don't have an education, they wouldn't let you go on training because they wanted you to learn to read maps and stuff. So they gave me a job washing dishes. <laughs> and uh, and I think that uh, my, prob my problem started in Canadian Army 
Because washing dishes, you know, washing dishes in lumber camp didn't bother me. I liked it. But to do that in Canadian Army, you know, it told me something that I never knew I could not accept. And that is, I wasn't as good as the next person. My biggest problem, it seems, that I had trouble accepting. Uh, all my life, I, I've always wanted to be somebody else. I felt that other people wanted, wanted me to be somebody else. And I felt that I, that God wanted me to be somebody. And last night when they talk about not being able to belong, and, and I think the first thing that touched me when I came to AA was that I was accepted here. I could see that, and, and I think that's why I came back. But I don't think belonging comes by people accepting you. I think belonging comes by you learning to accept yourself and willingness to walk in life from where you are with what you have. I think belonging, it's not a good idea. I think is a living experience. And I think the difference between now is that I have learned to accept an awful lot of things that in AA that I could not accept before, including not being perfect. <laughs> you know, you would never believe I'm a perfectionist. I mean, if you see me laying in the sidewalk with long hair, wine sores, and dirty, you would never stop and say, now there lies a perfectionist. <laughs> well, I didn't see it either. You know, I, I didn't see it. Kathy, my wife Kathy and I, we met in AA almost 22 years now. We have married for 22 years and we have six children. Something to be said about being compulsive. <laughs> but, but, I, but, but I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, and, uh, Kathy and, uh, Kathy and I would speak together now and then in our area, and Kathy would say that she is the type of person who should have never taken a drink. And I am that type of person. I, I have never been a social drinker. I don't think that I have ever met a social drinker, except a couple of years ago I met one. Almost drive me crazy. Uh, His father, Bill Mooney, sent me a ticket to travel to Georgia. Now, I've been traveling all my life, but nobody ever sent me a first-class ticket. These Alkis, when they sober up, they're too damn cheap to send you a first-class ticket. <laughs> so I get on a train and a plane, and I'm looking for my seat, and the girl says, you belong in the front. And you know how, how we are, I said to myself, well, it's about time they asked me to, <laughs> to carry the message first class. Uh, and I said in the front, and the lady, the black lady, said right next to me, and you know, you can tell right away she was rich. Funny how you can tell rich people. She ordered a double martini. Now, you know when you're an alcoholic, you said next to a person who orders a double martini, right away you start thinking. I put my 26 years of experience right away. I said to myself, I wonder if she's an alky. <laughs> so they gave her a drink and she put it down. It don't mean anything to me because alkies are con artists. I said to myself, she's just pretending that she doesn't want a drink. She's going to grab it in a minute. <laughs> you know, she forgot a drink and I didn't. <laughs> she took a book out. I couldn't believe it. And I'm watching her without watching her, you know what I mean? Because I'm too intelligent to be obvious. 
And she actually started reading a book. And I started getting sweaty. <laughs> because you know how the plane shakes, it's going to spill the drink. <laughs> then, uh, you know, about hours went by, it was only a few minutes. I looked at her finally, and you know, she was really interested reading the book. I mean, she was really interested, she forgot a drink, and I was going to tell her. <laughs> Look, lady, it's a double martini. <laughs> I would never be able to live with a social drinker. <laughs> But I'm, uh, I was 21 years old when I got my discharge, and I was very happy, because I didn't like the Army. And I was with a friend. He, he says to me, you and I will go out and we'll buy suits and get dressed up, and there is a place, this is in Montreal. I know a place you and I can go, and we'll have a few drinks. So he brought me to a blurry cafe. We're all dressed up. I had about $300 in my pocket. We went to blurry cafe in Montreal in, in, in the third floor. And as you walk in, they had a four-piece orchestra and the girl standing in front, she was singing practically with no clothes on. And I think that's where I received my first spiritual experience. <laughs> By this time, I've only been thinking about girls. I haven't gone out with one yet. Because, you know, washing dishes, it really, I never went home. Never went home. An obsession, it really denies you from living. You know, and uh, I have always been obsessed to myself, long before I took a drink. And uh, and I would and I would keep it alive by saying to myself, "Well, suppose my people find out that I'm washing dishes in the army." This idea of it, it, it used to bother me when people will say. The truth will set you free. <laughs> my, my people used to say, the only thing that it is honorable in man, it's the truth. A and there is no substitute. The truth offended me. Uh, I really believe that, and I don't know why, but I say this. I think that I am a type of person that by myself, I would have never been able to accept as much truth as I have in myself. I think that I needed uh, this type of a program, type of a people that would help you, people who care. And I think also uh, the thing that we call faith. I needed all these things to start uh, put myself together. St. Francis in our 11th step says, for it is in self-forgetting that you find. And you know, I can see the wisdom behind that, but I also know that for me, that's going to be a lifetime job just trying to. <laughs> but I can understand. But you see the thing with me, I, Kathy says that, that, that she should I needed a drink, and I don't know about you, but when I took a drink, maybe because I am an alcoholic, in a matter of very short time, I really enjoyed where I was, more so than I have ever been in my life, because I have always wanted to belong. And I think what I liked about drinking in the early days, for some reason, I can get close to people after a few drinks. And I can talk to anybody. You know, I wasn't sensitive that you were educated, that you had a degree, and that I didn't talk with English. I don't know why the drink removed that very quickly. And I, I, I fall in love. 
getting drunk. I love to be drunk. Like some people say, I never go out to get drunk. I go out and get drunk. I love to be drunk. You know, if I fall down, I just sit there and I laugh and I say, Christ, John, you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I liked everything about being drunk. You know, this place I was in a nightclub, you go and give this girl some money and she'll sing a song for you. And I see guys ask the girl and they dance around. And here I am, 21 years old, I have never danced. And I liked it. I think I was in there an hour when I walk up and I gave her some money to sing a song for me. And I did like everybody else did. I picked the best looking girl in a joint. At least I thought she was the best looking girl in a joint. But not necessarily so. Because alcohol also affects your vision. <laughs> Because I used to fall in love every night, and I mean, uh, I could see stars in her eyes until I woke up the next morning, and I looked at her, and I said, holy Christ, <laughs> you were so cute last night, I know you were cute last night, but you know, a few more drinks and I'm falling in love all over again. <laughs> and someone said, John, why do you drink? Difficult to explain. <laughs> Difficult to explain. The, 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 I'm sure if someone said that night in Blurry Cafe, John, you're an alcoholic, and you know he would have told the truth. Because there is another thing I have been taught in the program. I suppose that maybe that I have to be an alcoholic and suffer what I have suffered but also to find AA and given the type of an education that I need in order to have a type of a state of mind that I must have to look back and to be able to see what happened in Glory Cafe at the age of 21. Today I know I became an alcoholic. When I really enjoyed drinking, you know, when I really like to talk to people, when I really can get too close to the girls, when I can go out with girls, all those things were not bad. Except that I couldn't do that sober. You know? There's a lot of things I did drunk that I would love to do sober. But I couldn't. And I suppose... If I had not been an alcoholic, any time I want to fall in love, all I have to do is have a few drinks. <laughs> Forget about it the next day. But I, I, I am an alcoholic, and, and, and alcoholism is an illness, and, and, and it's a progression. And that's what happened to me. The time came in my life when I drank for no other reason than to pass out. This, to me, that's what I did. I drink to totally remove myself from, from, from reality. And I look for drink to remove myself. There were no longer the feelings that I used to have falling in love and dancing, fighting with cops and fighting with other bums. Those things that I love to do they were gone in my life. And I knew it. But I couldn't stop. I really tried to stop. Because I've always wanted the nice clothes. You know, I had dreams. You know, it's, it, people sometimes don't believe that bums have dreams too. Because I think that everybody, everybody likes to be respected and look up to. I don't think there's anything wrong to think that way. I don't think there is anything wrong wanting to be important in life. And God knows I, I like to belong. I, I have told so many lies. Now, I'm also an intelligent person. I've always said, you know, I'm sick, not stupid. I knew the lie robs you from honor. It robs you from respect, and it certainly takes away a feeling of worthiness. 
Because that's where it comes from. But this idea of wanting to belong in life, this idea of telling people so that they would accept you, I don't think that there is anything wrong with that. I don't try to be perfect. I'm just saying, in a man's life, there has to be something greater than that. And that is to be able to stand up on what you believe in, because if there is going to be any hope in life for human mind, which is something greater than what you achieve, or intellect, then it has to be born, the hope has to be born on what you believe in. And hope, of course, is an excitement of tomorrow. Your knowledge will never give you that. Your money will never give you that. Your education will not give you that. But your faith will. And for human mind, it's, it, 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 it's good. It's exciting. I was over to uh, Ianus, Ianus uh, and Cape Cod not too long ago. They invited me to speak in, in, a, in, a, in a banquet. And this, i got to tell you this, this is really super. They're all psychologists and psychiatrists. <laughs> Very heavy. That's the first time I felt I had a psychological problem. Uh, and there was yearly banquet, and they asked me to speak. Oh, of course, it was an honor for me. I can you imagine me without an education and being asked to speak with all these brains. And I'm sitting with this guy that I've seen in the meetings. And, of course, he talks like a brain. And he says to me, you know, John, we've been here centuries, and we don't even use 10% of our brain. <laughs> and I said, you know, that, that's fantastic. I never thought about it that way. And then he says, that's why spiritual program is so good. You always can learn, no matter how long you live, forever. You can always learn. The beautiful thing about it, I understood. As limited as I am, and, and as slow as I am in learning, I find the greatest spiritual experience for me is to know that I grow slowly. And that my mind looks back 26 years ago tonight. And if someone ever told me that night, John, one day, Ed's going to call you. All the way from Fayetteville, North Carolina. I didn't even know it was in existence. To replace a friend of mine who was supposed to speak here tonight. Uh, I'm glad that he is well, but I'm also glad he couldn't make it. <laughs> Don't tell him I said so, but I'm glad he couldn't make it. So much about being humble. <laughs> but I was in a mission one night, and Indian fella came to see me. I have once met him before in Tucker Lake, New York. He brought me to his home. He was married then, and I had a nice home, and his wife was a nurse, and he just bought a, a new Ford, and he gave me a ride, and I stayed there that night. And I left the next day. Well, Ike lost everything, and he became a bum. And he wound up in Salvation Army in Syracuse, New York. And they started meetings, and he got sober. And one night, someone told him there is another Indian in the mission. He needs help. So I was in the mission one night when Ike walked in, and he says to me, do you remember who I am? I said, of course I do. He says, I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, good for you. Because Bum's always joining something. <laughs> and he says, I came here to bring you to a meeting. I said, I don't want to go to a meeting. 
Because, like I tell you, I'm a very sensitive person. And if I'm not dressed too well, you know, if I had a long hair and wine sores, like I always do when I sober up and take about three weeks, sometimes a month, before my face would clear up, I'm a, what you call a, a person who cannot forget himself. And I, I don't like to walk into a, a lot of people when I think everybody's looking at me. And I didn't want to go to meetings. And I says, well, they, they have coffee and donuts and, and they're free. So I said, we'll go. <laughs> and I walked into the central group of all the groups in Syracuse. Central group was one of those groups that there were no bums there. And there was a fella stood at the door. He was a lawyer, sober 13 years. And every Friday night, he stood there and he would shake hands to all the people who walked in there. And of course, when he seen me, you know, he grabbed my hand with his two hands and he says to me, am, am I so glad to see you? And, and I wasn't too glad to see him at all. <laughs> and I sit down, and, and you wouldn't believe. My, my first speaker in AA was a lady judge. You know, if you was to organize AA, you would never bring me to a meeting where a lady, lady judge speak. You probably would bring me somewhere where an Indian chief speaking who don't talk with English, probably have no teeth, and a broken feather or some damn thing. <laughs> And you probably say, well, this Indian can identify with that. Well, this Indian no want to identify with that. <laughs> I got news for you. <laughs> the hell with him with his broken feather. <laughs> but it was, but I said, you know, they sit you right in front and this lady got up and her father was a judge. And the first thing she said, if you are new, try to identify. And that's enough to screw up your mind. <laughs> now, here I am, I'm in my 20s. And I've been away from my reservation since at the age of 14. I spent four years in lumber camp washing dishes. And I joined the Canadian Infantry, where I spent three years and a half washing more than dishes. <laughs> I take a drink, and I'm in skits for seven years, and here I am, I've never been married, never had a driving license, never owned a car, cannot read and write, and I'm sitting there with long hair and wine sores, I'm dirty, I'm in a mission, and I'm supposed to pay uh, 35 cents a night, and I'm behind three weeks' rent, <laughs> you know, I have financial problems. Uh, and, and, and I'm listening to Judge telling me, please try to identify. You know, can you imagine me saying to myself, you know, I'm just like her? <laughs> Besides the judge that I've met 25, 23 times, he never once asked me to try to identify. <laughs> Oh, I had one track of mine. He always gave me six months. <laughs> and after the meeting, I was leaving. But you know what it used to be like, what happens, and what it's like now. That's where you put. That's where you learn to put your life together. Because there is something about human mind that when you look back, you can see the truth where you come from. And, and, uh, and this lawyer, it seems that God put somebody in a very strange way. Who would ever pick a lawyer for me? Yeah. Uh, you know, as I was leaving, I think about him sometimes. St. Francis also said, <laughs> I talk about St. Francis, but I, I, it's in 11th step. I, I didn't put him there. 
You know, I, I go to discussion meetings in Holy Cross twice a week, and what they do, they read the step. That's why I go over there. And, and in 11 step, to have a prayer of St. Francis. And Bill Wilson said, don't be offended because he's a saint. The only reason we've chosen him because he went through the same thing emotionally, you and I did. You know, and, and, and I'm sponsoring Father Terry. And Father Terry, every once in a while we talk, and he's telling me more about St. Francis. And he was really crazy one time. <laughs> you know, I could walk with him side by side and wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> and St. Francis said, Lord, I, he said, I pray that I may understand rather than looking to be understood. And what I can see is myself on my first meeting. You know, when you have wine sores, when you're a bum for all the years, you don't dress well. They know you go there to get donuts. Not too many people, not too many people say that kid will make it. Not too many people want to bother you if you if you're not dressed well. It's human nature. I'm not against it. I, I'm the same way. I can't stand a drunk. <laughs> we have noontime meeting in Worcester. And there's about two hundred of us in there. You know, you, it's a mixed group every day. We have people like me and uh, uh, insurance guy. We have newspaper reporters, and you know. Dr. Lars and Indians and stuff like that. And we were all sitting there one night and a drunk walked in. He had a wine. <laughs> Everybody looked around like if he had a venereal disease or something. <laughs> Who the hell is that? <laughs> and I said to myself, I hope he doesn't sit next to me. <laughs> and some people get up and said, I like the live ones. I said, goody, goody for you. You can have them. <laughs> it is not normal to love someone who is drunk. You know what I mean? He stinks. He never brushes teeth. He don't shave. He repeats himself. And he put his arms around you and he spits on you. <laughs> It's not normal to to be to feel good next to him. <laughs> Give him a needle and knock him out for Christ's sake. Get rid of him. <laughs> but I picture myself a terrible looking person. And as I'm on my way out, this lawyer put his arms around me, and that's why I say that any person who does that, in that moment, he has a very special state of mind. I also see that human beings are capable. St. Francis is not saying anything that you and I are not capable of trying. Because everything St. Francis talks about starts by individual who is born with gift, who has right to choose for himself. But it takes a special person, as I can see it, like a lawyer who stopped me, because he understood. Not all of us understand. Because being there is not an ingredient of an understanding. I think understanding comes in believing. And thank God he didn't say, I'm a very rich, like he was. <laughs> Or that I'm a lawyer. But he said the right thing for me. And people in AA, you know, with no uncertain terms, told me that they come back because they needed me. They used to say that. We love you, John. Come back. We need you. And I believe that. And somebody asked me one time what I thought what helped me the most in AA. And I said, I came back. And I did. And that's where I met another special person in my life, uh, my sponsor, Pat. Pat. It's a, a skid row bum. Long, many more years than I have. Uh, and, and, and I never, I never liked Pat. <laughs> Pat, the only Pat had a degree. 
and nothing worse than a bum with a degree. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we would be in Sally, and Major Harvey would give him a job in the office, and I would get a job working on a truck for a dollar a week. And I'd be working my head off, and I'd come home, and Pat standing outside in his office is all dressed Of course he's all dressed up. You know, some poor bastard probably died in the cirrhosis of liver, and he's wearing his suit, <laughs> you know. And he says to me, John, did you work hard today? He's giving me the needle, you know. And I look for approval, you know. I don't like people who put me down. <laughs> and it used to bother me. I used to say to myself, Next time we get drunk, I'm going to kill the bastard. And, 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 and a couple of times, I almost did. He, he, he used to say, never drink with that Indian. He hits you for nothing. <laughs> he never could figure it out. <laughs> but someone said he joined something. And one night, Pat walks in, all dressed up with a girl. And he comes over and he says to me, John, I, I'm your sponsor. He says, I have a new car outside. And by this time, you know, nobody knew I lived in a mission. Because I was always afraid. I had a terrible time with those things. You know, that people will reject you, if you know, or they wouldn't respect you. And But Pat, you know, he was a bum longer than I was, so he didn't bother me. And, you know, every night, he would pick me up. And he would bring me to meetings. And he used to bring me have a sandwich. <laughs> Pat used to say, you can only eat half a sandwich. And, and I remember one time someone said, John, you know Pat never eats sandwiches. And then thought came to my mind. Because I, I was well enough to think that he would stop the car and buy me a sandwich and bring half of it. And I would be sitting in a meeting in 11th step and I would be listening to prayer of St. Francis. And St. Francis always said, <laughs> here I go again. I pray that I may love rather than to seek love. And love is a personal sacrifice. But something that you do because you consider another person and you don't consider yourself at all. And I'm intelligent enough to know that anyone who brings me a sandwich in a mission is not looking anything from me. Nothing. I have nothing to offer. I'm not even an attractive person. Someone had to really believe in something. And you know, I never was able to tell Pat, thank you, because I never was well enough and 17 years after Pat got sober, he took a drink, and, and he died in, in West Street, where him and I have slept many times. And that's the way it is. But he used to bring me to meetings every night, and he used to say, John, you know, you cannot stay sober and live with those bums. And I am 28 years old. I have never had my own place, and I was afraid to leave. I thought maybe I could uh, go to meetings every night and stay in the mission, you know, for a while. But I think the God must have been on his side because one night mission burned down. <laughs> and Pat said that was the grace of God. And next day, he brought me to the 12th Step House in Fayette Street. And they gave me a job. They paid me $7 and a half a week and a free bed. And my job was to wash and wax floors, make coffee, and, and answer the telephone and, and wash dishes. <laughs> By the way, I bought me a dishwasher. <laughs> I, I had a fellow had it all hooked up, and I said to him, let me push the first button. <laughs> I pushed the button, and it hums, and I said, hum, you cheap bastard. <laughs> the fellow said, what's going on here? I said, it's a long story. You'll never understand. <laughs> but, 
But I get thrown out uh, this place, and this somebody called a lady, her name was Anne. I never met her. But she was looking for help one night, very late. And there were members who come to this club, and they play cards all night. And when I told them that there was a girl who needed help, they told me that she's been around for years and says that's all she does is use people in AA. Now, I knew, uh, I knew it was wrong then. Uh, I know it's wrong today. Except today I can understand, but then I couldn't. And uh, I don't know how to act, especially when I'm right. The only way I knew how was do what I've always done, and punch somebody in the mouth. That's what I did. I upset the table while they were playing cards, and I punched one of them right in his mouth and knocked him down right on his ass. And that was my first 12-step cough. You know, I, 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 I could have started my own group, you know, but they throw me out. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm walking down Fayette Street, and my sponsor picked me up. You know, it was really something. Somebody called him up, he got up. He he didn't have too far to go, but he got up and picked me up, and he brought me to his home. And next day, he brought me to Major Harvey and Salvation Army, where I worked for two years and a half. Went to meetings every night. You know, when I was sober five years, I was still in Skid Row. I wasn't working, and I I had uh, problems because you stop identifying in AA. In AA, it works. It's strange how AA works, you know. It's, it's people, but they care, you know. And I knew they'd start saying that Indians should go to work. <laughs> Uh, and they say it in front ear too. You know, somebody stand up, been sober three months, and he's got his license back. I'm sober five years, and I don't have one. Somebody's been sober a couple of years, and he's back in a big bed. I'm sleeping in somebody's car with a white cat that nobody wants. Nothing you can do with a white cat, no matter what state of mind you have. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> how are you going to share that to somebody? I'm sleeping with a white cat. You know. Some of them go to school and get divorced and married again, and here I am. So I left Syracuse. I walked away from I was 33 years old. And I walked into Marlboro Mass at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I slept in a hotel in a men's room. But again, this was the grace of God. I met Paul who owned a restaurant. He says to me, John, there is a a new meeting starting in Worcester. Would you like to go? I said, sure. So he brought me over there, and 21 years ago, they started a first discussion on steps in Worcester. The second day I arrived, I walk into that meeting, and what they did over there, they would read the steps. Now, I've heard the steps been read here, like we do here, but they read the whole chapter, the pages. And then you have 20 people from all walks of life expressing their opinions, their belief as to what step means to them. And Bill Wilson said, this is a program of recovery. Sure, it's suggested. Whether it's suggested or not, you know, I needed to learn how to live. I have never knew how to live. And it's so frustrating because you kill time, you feel unworthy. I have all the desires that other human beings have, except with me, I suppress them. I tell lies about them. I pretend I don't have them. I want to tell you something. It's difficult to stay sober that way. Sobriety for me, it was painful. And you know, when I've heard the steps, I didn't understand what they were talking about. Lucky for me, I never had a driving license, so Paul went there twice a week. And I had been going there for 21 years. 
And my life has changed because you learn things that helps you to approach life different. You know, I've learned to one, for instance, one word. People would say, alcoholics are self-centered and extreme. I say, goody, goody, goody. <laughs> well, I've been self-centered and extreme for 50, 80 years. But for better than 30 years, I didn't know. How does a person live with self-centered and extreme? How the hell do I know? I didn't understand. And someone said, you know, alcoholics are self-willed and extreme. And I said, goody, goody, goody. I didn't know. I know I am an alcoholic, and I know I'm self-centered and extreme. But I didn't know, how does a person live in every day with self-centered and extreme? <laughs> if you live in an alcoholic, you probably know. But I didn't. I didn't know that my emotions, my attitude, everything about me robs me from living. I didn't even know that I don't even have power to change people or myself. I am fighting a type of life that, that all I could do was make my life miserable, and I didn't know it. I talk about God, we talk about God. They say, if you're going to have a spiritual experience, you've got to let go. Let go of what? Everything. Me, I fight. I didn't know. So I go to these meetings, and, and you know, my life started to change. Paul was also on the restaurant. And I was there one day, and the waiters asked me, said, John, can you paint a house? I said, sure, I can paint a house. You know, I used to paint steeples when I was in skits. <laughs> I used to love to paint steeples. You're so far away up in the air, nobody bothers you. And I used to get $40 a day, $20 a night, and rest of it at the weekend, so I can drink every night. <laughs> I mean, this Italian guy had something going until I passed out up in the, in the bell. <laughs> he thought insurance didn't cover that. He fired me. <laughs> I passed out in a big bell. I could just crawl into it. I was so drunk. I'd been drinking wine all day. I've been, I'm a hundred feet in the air. And smiley. A little Irishman, he was drunker than I. He passed out at 10.30 in the morning. At, li at least I last him 2.30. <laughs> so I drag him in the bell, and I keep on working. And I'm so far up in the air, the Italian guy couldn't see me whether I was working or not. He comes in the afternoon, and he hollers up there. You still up there? I said, sure. <laughs> so Rita says to me, could you come over and, and give an estimate? So I did, and I gave her an estimate of $300, and I got my first job because other contractors wanted twelve to $1,400. And you know, it's, it, it's nice to talk about. When I left yesterday, I left a 14-room house. And uh, my wife says to me, you know, I just bought her car, spent $9,200. You know, living like white man, dollar down, dollar week. <laughs> and and, and um, he said, honey, you want to take my car? <laughs> and I said, no, because, I, you know, my family is grown. I have a twin who went to Canada. He wants to go to university in Canada. So he went there last week to sign papers. And uh, so my wife took off yesterday morning. We both took off. And my wife drove to Caribou, Maine to pick up one of my sons, one of my twins. And then he goes to Germany. And he's 18 years old for the summer. And then he comes back and goes to the college in September. But you know, it's so good to be able to stand up here and look back and, and, and see my life. How, how it has totally changed. Not that I have changed so much. Uh, I am always, I am still the same person that I never could accept before. But I think faith is also helps you put yourself together and be effective as a total person.
you, you, you don't have to be perfect to have faith. As a matter of fact, if you want to be perfect, you'll never have faith. Faith is not necessarily something that it is good, in a sense. But it is something very real. I think that I have learned to love as much as I can, just the way I am. I think to some extent, extent I have learned to understand, like St. Francis said, to some extent, just the way I am. Anytime I'm conscious of it, I, I can understand. I learned to put my arms on another person and really care sometimes. But I'm going to tell you something. There are some times when I'm irrational. I'm very dangerous when I'm irrational. No animal can match me when I'm irrational. It never lasts. Two minutes maybe. But in those two minutes, I can spoil the relationship forever. Because I lose control. I have to watch it. But it has never changed. Sometimes, I hate to say, I get jealous. Not all the time, but sometimes I am. And sometimes I wish if I was better looking. <laughs> Especially when I meet some nice looking girl or someone going out with. So I have learned that to be total, you have to accept not only good things, those are easy to accept. What about the imperfection of man? Something that you're born and die with. And what happens to you when you cannot accept these things? You become self-conscious. You don't trust your judgment. You don't trust your feelings. It, it, it seems to, my life, it seems that all my life, I have never been a bad person. I didn't escape reality because I was any different than the younger people. It's just that I could never accept the truth. We talk about God in AA, and, and, and I've always felt that if only I can, I, I knew what I had to be to be close to God, but I never could. Until I came to a, a and someone said, you come to God just the way you are. If you're going to open the door to relationship, you got to be honest. It's not a perfection that allows people to be closed, but it is honesty. And the same way with God. Go to him just the way you are. Admit to yourself, to God, and to another human being, the exact nature of your wrong. Open the door. And you know, when I could understand it, it makes sense to me. And I said, I can do that. I didn't do it well. But I try. When I finished painting this house, I hope you're still with me. <laughs> I can't help it if my mind goes some ways and comes back, you know. <laughs> it's just like a boomerang, you know. I got the job. I said to Paul, I got the job. But, you know, I'm still sleeping outside. I said, I don't have money. He said, go back and ask Rita. She'll give you enough money to start. She gave me $100. <laughs> so I figured, I figured if you're going to be a president in your own company, you might as well buy white coveralls. <laughs> so I went to the paint store and I bought white coveralls. I bought a paint and scrapers and I, I brought everything to a job. And then I met a man who worked in a telephone company where I borrowed a ladder and he delivered it. He said it was against the rules, but you know Alk is. <laughs> I finished painting this house, and I owe Paul in a restaurant about 63 or 64 dollars. 
and I met a plumber in AA. He said, John, I have a ranch house in Hudson, which is only seven miles. All you need is a 10-foot step ladder. So I borrowed a 10-foot step ladder, and I got all my drop cloths together and my white coveralls, and I stood in the corner, and I stopped the bus. And, uh, and, uh, and this guy stopped, and he looks at my ladder, and then he looks at me, and he says, you, you can't be serious. I said, I am serious. I'm self-employed. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think he was an alky. You know what he says to me? If I give you a ride, would you promise you'll never do it again? <laughs> <laughs> my next house was a school teacher taught school for 40 years and she retired I said to her one night you think you could help me to memorize the 69 questions I want a driving license and she said I've taught thousands of people how to read and write and I went to see her every night and and sometimes later she helped me to memorize the 69 questions and I knew them inside out because I suppose I'm afraid of failure, too. So I was very confident when I went over to take my test. And I get inside in this little room, and this guy, he only asked me two questions. And I was insulted. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to leave. I said to myself, what in the hell is he used to have all this education and nobody gives a damn? <laughs> you know? I work so hard for it and nobody cares. <laughs> so Paul came to see me with 11 passenger station wagon, black one. Said, so John, for $750, you can buy this car. But I didn't have that kind of money, so I asked the lady upstairs where I was painting, and I think she gave me like $250. And this nice-looking blonde Saturday night meeting in Marlboro, she co-signed for me. And here I was in my 50 years sobriety. I was president in my own company. <laughs> I had a driving license and a 511 passenger station wagon. <laughs> so I decided I should find me a girlfriend. But I had four teeth missing. And I felt the type of a girl that I was looking for, you couldn't find with four teeth missing. <laughs> you know, in Syracuse, New York, there is a bar room they call Smitty's. Now, that's where all the New York Indians drink. I'm a Mi'kmaq Indian. I don't drink in Smitty's because Mi'kmaqs and New York Indians don't communicate too well. And every once in a while, 20 of us Mi'kmaqs would go to get drunk, and we go to Smithers, and we would communicate. <laughs> and, uh, and one day I was walking by Smithers, feeling very good. Someone opened the door, and he threw this guy out, and that's where I met Smiley. Smiley is a little Irishman, weighs no more than 80 pounds, with a degree, by the way. I picked him up, and I said to him, what in the hell's wrong with you? He said, it's those Indians inside. Well, I said, they can't do that to you. He said, no, they can't. I said to him, what do you say you and I go in there? And we will clean them up. He says, it's a good idea. Well, by the Jesus, it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> you know, my, you know I, I woke up in a general hospital, uh, uh, and I lost four teeth, and Smiley sat in there without scratch. The other thing, I get rid of him then. So I was looking for a dentist in AA, <laughs> and uh, someone said to me, there's a new one, goes to the other meetings. So I went over one night, and this guy, it must have been about 50 years old, he had white, white hair. So I studied him for three weeks, because I can't stand pain. As much pain I have lived with for years, I hate pain. Just thinking about it bothers me. And I don't like dentists because they hurt you. So I was looking for a dentist that wouldn't hurt you. 
And I studied this guy about three weeks, and, and at the end of three weeks, I said to myself, this guy wouldn't hurt nobody. <laughs> so I approached him one night. I said to him, I wonder if you could help me. I have a little problem. He said, what's the problem? And I said, I'm looking for a girlfriend, but I have four teeth missing, and I want you to put them back. So he gave me his card, and I went to see him. And this guy, you know, he was going to take three months. He pulls one and fills the other one. And, you know, I have no patience. You know the old saying, I want when I want when I want it. But you get what you need and not what you want. And I went for three months, and I still got the same teeth. Finally got my teeth, and I was the happiest person. I went to meeting that night, and I met Mary. Mary owned the Faith House, run the Faith House, home of an alcoholic woman. She said, John, I'm told you have a car. I said, 11 passengers. <laughs> and uh, Mary said, I, I have nine girls. I'm looking for someone to bring the girls to a meeting. Would you like the job? I said, I'll be very happy to. That's where I met my wife, Kathy. I brought these girls to a meeting, and on our way back, I asked her if she wanted to go out on date, and she said no. <laughs> very difficult to grow up. Very difficult. I'm a very sensitive person. I, I get hurt easily, and I don't suffer well. But on my way home, I, I start to think. I said to myself, who in the hell she thinks she is? she is living in that place with all the girls. They don't have nothing. And here I am. I'm president in my own company. <laughs> I have new set of teeth and <laughs> an 11 passenger station wagon. Who the hell wants her anyway? <laughs> so Thursday night, I picked the girls up again and Went to meeting, and on our way back, I said to her, would you like to go to show in Boston? And she said, yes. And we did, and on our way back, I asked her to marry me. <laughs> she said, but I don't know you. And I said, it's all right. We still have five miles to go. We'll get acquainted. <laughs> so we got married. Nobody showed up. Nobody showed up. Only six people in my wedding. We only had $85. Most people felt that poor Indian was just doing so good. Now he's marrying a girl living in the faith house. But I think our problem is alcoholism. Love is something you cannot figure out. You know, it's not how long it takes. Love is, love is, love, I think, is the most precious thing. And what makes it so precious? I think that the only way any human being can love is love the way he is or she is. There is no other way. And I think it's the most misunderstood thing today. And the relationships are the most difficult in our generation. Fifty percent of all marriages wound up in divorce. And you know, I didn't know anything about it either. All I knew is I loved Kathy. I loved her first time I seen her. I still do. Except now there is something more than love. We have learned to work together. And somebody asked me, I spoke in al conference last week in, in South Bend, Indiana. And he said, John, uh, what about when you stop drinking? Aren't you supposed to be home so you, you know, so you can show your kids that you love them? You don't show love. 
you know? And you don't lose it because you're not home. You don't lose it because you're not home. Love is giving yourself. But you know, uh, Kathy and I, we stopped the car. We counted our change. We had $85. We went on our honeymoon and came back with 35 <laughs> That's going out to live. And we moved into a three-room three apartment, I guess it was. And Kathy and I had absolutely nothing. I mean, we had nothing. There was no beds in this place. There was no mattresses, no pillows. We had no clothes. The only thing we had was the coffee table that was given to us from Fate House. And even newlyweds cannot sleep in coffee table. <laughs> Kathy says to me, where are we going to sleep? I said, we'll sleep on the floor. You, you know, you, a lot of people can have a lot of fun on the floor. <laughs> you know, I, I spoke in Westchester County one time, and they're very rich people up there. And I mentioned the fact you can have a lot of fun on the floor. And after this meeting, this rich lady came to me with all these diamonds. And she said, young man, I don't know how much fun you can have on the floor, she said. But I know you can have a lot of fun on the oriental rug. <laughs> <laughs> I said, thank God you identify, you know. <laughs> but while we laying on the floor, I said to Kathy, you know, I would like to have a boy because I'm the only one left. And I don't want to leave one day all alone. And I said to her, you know, if you give me a boy... I'll buy you a diamond. And you know, it's a little sick. There we are sleeping on the floor because I cannot afford a bed. But I'm promising a diamond. But you know, the beautiful thing about Kathy and I, she was sick enough so she believed me. <laughs> and so this Christmas she was in a hospital waiting for a boy. And I walked into a bank first time in my life. I'm 35 years old. But I was painting a house belonged to the president of St. Mary's Bank, and he said, John, if you ever need money, come over and see me. So I went over to see him. I needed $200. He said, John, you don't have a collateral. And you know, I didn't know what in hell it was. Do you know of all the things that people talk about in AA, they don't talk about collateral? <laughs> Do you know I never speak without talking about collateral? <laughs> and if you know if you're sitting there, if you don't have collateral, you stay the hell away from the banks. <laughs> you know, I went three banks and they want collateral. <laughs> then I went see Paul. I said, Paul, they want collateral. He said, don't worry about it, John, you don't have any. <laughs> So I said, what am I going to do? He said, pray. I said, Christ, Paul, they don't need God. They need collateral, you know. <laughs> I got the message. He didn't, you know. <laughs> I will tell you something. You don't get collateral by praying either. <laughs> but I went Hudson for some reason. Someone said, try Hudson. And I met the gentleman over there who was retiring that year. And I told, I told him the story about Kathy and I, just as true as I could. She, he says to me, we don't lend money with sad stories. But he said, I've always prided myself when I've seen an honest. He said, how much do you want anyway? And you know, it sounded so good, I just couldn't let it go. I said, $400. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that, that old skid row feeling, come right back. I uh, just... I knew I had him. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, God. So I walked into uh, Alan Jewelers, and I said to him, show me the best diamond that you have, and he did. I said, now show me the cheapest one. That you have. <laughs> and he said, for this, you can buy for 150 I said, I'll take it. He said, you want to charge it, of course. I said, of course. And, and, and I brought it to my wife. And 3 o'clock in the morning, she calls me up, crying. 
She said, honey, it's a girl. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, I'll go over and check her myself tomorrow morning. And, uh, and she was a girl. She wasn't mistaken. But next Christmas came along. And my wife was in there again, and I received a call, and she's still crying. <laughs> Honey, she said, it's a girl. But you know what they say in AA, an experience is a great teacher. <laughs> uh, I said to her, you know, because my wife, you know, you, when you know when a person loves you, she's as hurt more than I was. And I said to her, don't worry about it. Just have an open mind, and, and we'll try again. <laughs> I've learned that in a... So next Christmas came along, and she was in there again. And I received a call, and she's still crying. This time, it is twin boys. So you know what I say. Sometimes, God will give you exactly what you want, providing you're willing to work hard for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, what do you say that next Christmas we hang our stockings and, and, and wait for Santa Claus? <laughs> and, and, and we did well for a couple of years, then, and the girl came along, which is now 16 years old, and another boy came along, which is now 14, going on 15. So that's my story. And in closing, probably among many things that I can look back in my own life with pride and with, with when I say with pride, with honor, I, my mind knows where I came from. But I think it's a very special experience from any human being who can look back without shame or guilt, but with pride when you examine your own footsteps. I don't think there is anything more precious to me than to be able to stand up here and being free to tell you about my life the best I know how. And to be able to listen to other people from all walks of life. To see myself in other people. It's, it doesn't take too much effort for me to to kneel down tonight and thank God for where I am. I even got a, a basket full of fruit. Christ Major Harvey never give that to me. I got I got a I got two bits in my room. That's something. I never understand a white man give two bits. <laughs> I don't need two bits. I'm all alone. You know the old saying that white man builds a big fire and he stands far away? An Indian builds a small fire and he stands very close. I don't know what it means, but he sounds good. <laughs> it must be another wise man who said that. <laughs> Terry, who is the priest, says to me, there was a wise man once said that you grow old gracefully. I said, whoever that bastard was, he must have been retarded because I don't, I don't go grow old gracefully. I got to think about how to get up in the morning. The second thing for me, I think my kids, they've never been hungry. My mother used to write a note to an Indian agent. I never went to school. When I wasn't walking 14 miles carrying that note looking for food, I, I had a sled with snowshoes and looking for wood. And I was just a kid. My mother said, I'm so proud of you never crying. Everybody cries, you know. Just that sometimes you love people so much you don't show it. Because you're the only one they can depend on. I tell you something. It's wrong under any circumstances to teach your loved ones to become a bum. 
to be dependent on other people for your own life. And especially when your brothers and sisters crying because they're hungry. And you're praying or you're doing something. Let me get something today. You know, I'm intelligent enough to know that I'm still afraid of hunger. If my, I got two refrigerators in my house. If they're not both of them are full, I get nervous. <laughs> I'm the only one getting nervous. I buy cases of stuff. My kids never been hungry. Never been. They've never been without anything. And I really believe that none of them ever once felt ashamed of my own footsteps. I also believe about my wife Kathy. Sure, I, I'm not an educated person. I'm not, uh, I'm, I don't know a lot of things that Terry, the priest, who knows. She's got all kinds of degrees. Nice guy to talk to. I have another friend who died now, was a professor in English. I used to learn a lot from him. He used to tell me something about Robert Frost. <laughs> I like one of his prayers, Robert Frost. When somebody asked him once to say a prayer, he looked up and he said, Dear Lord, forgive me for all the little tricks that I played on you. And I'll forgive you for a big one you played on me. <laughs> I can identify with that. <laughs> to be respected in the community. Not to have cops coming to your house. But there is something greater than all these things, you know. A human hunger. You know... It's good to have a big house. God knows all my life I wanted a big home. When I used to sleep between two mattresses, I dreamed about it. It's, look, it's good. Even if you don't have a nice clothes, it's good to know that you can buy a nice clothes. God knows I dreamt about it between two mattresses with a little dog that I called Brownie. I could picture myself having all kinds of nice clothes. It's good to have new cars, especially if you're not a mechanic. I keep it for two years and I buy another one. It's good. It's good that your kids never been ashamed of you. It's good that your life, wife loves you and respects you. It's good even sometimes that big men look up to you. But none of these things are the ingredients that nourishes the human hunger. I often think about Elvis Presley. These death said, if he liked you, he would bought a car, a Cadillac. It didn't bother him. The world cried when he died. Apparently, the world can love you and still can take your own life. The ingredient that nourishes the human hunger doesn't come from other people or is it not for sale. I go back to 11th step and I go back to St. Francis. St. Francis said, Lord, make me. He didn't say, I want to be. Make me an instrument for thy will. For where there is hate, I will try to bring love. And where there is sadness, I will try to bring joy. Where there is doubt, I will try to bring faith. Where there is darkness, I will try to bring light. And then he says, Lord, I pray that I may learn to understand rather than seeking to be understood. I may learn to love rather than to seek love to console and then he says for it is in self forgetting that you find and in giving that you receive and you're dying that you live forever as limited as I am of all these things I know one thing for sure 
When AA says life is a journey, it means that we try to do what the program said we should. If you take time to love someone for five minutes, that man will remember it for 50 years. Remember, the only way you can love is just the way you are. You don't have to be something special. But the way you are, pops, are the most special thing that you have. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.